Hey, it's Alex Williams of the New Stack. Welcome to the New Stack Makers, a podcast where we talk about application development, deployment, and management at scale. Alex Williams of the New Stack here at Serverless Conf, and we got the main stage here, and I'm so happy about it. I, I didn't expect this. I've been thinking in the back of my mind that maybe there'd be the opportunity to be on the main stage because the cube was here yesterday, and you know, I'm like, oh, they got the main stage. It's really nice, and so it's nice to be here. So thank you for joining us. I'm here with Linda. Linda, why don't you introduce yourself and then pass the mic on to you, Emily? Hey, I'm Linda Nichols. I'm a cloud uh, enablement leader at CloudReach, and I'm from Norfolk, Virginia. And I'm Emily Young. I'm Cloud Software Engineer coverage, and I'm remote based on Las Vegas. All right, great. Um, Las Vegas. What brought you to Las Vegas, and and you know, what do you, do you spend most of your time in your house, or what, what do you what do you do? Um, well, I made a list of everything I wanted in a city. I was tired of Virginia. I made a list of everything I wanted, and uh, Las Vegas fit the bill of the best um, as far as good weather, good shopping, lots to do. Um, the airport is amazing, and uh, the cost of living is just fantastic. And the weather, I love the weather. I love the hot. And yeah, I work in town last day. Yeah. yeah, well, I have a mic on, so you can just hold that. And, and we were talking beforehand a little bit about the show and stuff, and you were talking, and I had a very funny conversation about your server, server full house. So, or serverful homes. So, serverless and serverful. How do you distinguish these two? You have to explain the serverful house first. Oh, well, so it's a serverful house because I just bought uh, 500 punch cards that were used in Los Alamos. Well, not used, I guess, because they're new still, but they're from Los Alamos. So, I don't know. I have a, an interest in vintage computing and old computers, mainframes, and servers. I'm not really sure where that fits in with serverless, but... Uh, it's compute. It's compute, yeah, and it's really interesting. I mean, being at both sides of it, both being at watching the sort of invention of computers from like the ENIAC and stuff like that, where, you know, a computer took an entire room, you had you know, all this custom hand-built stuff with thousands of tubes, and now, you know, we have these functions and, we don't even worry about what the computer is. We just upload these little functions. I guess like little punch cards. We just upload our little punch cards to the cloud. And, <laughs> oh, and then we get back that. output from, from AWS like, or Google or whatever. Yeah. Little punch cards, little punch cards. I'm envisioning yeah. a new talk for you. Yeah, little punch cards. I love it. Yeah, so like, maybe next year. Next year I'll make some functional... They're, they're uh, quite serverful, those yeah. little punch cards. Some serverless punch cards. <laughs> um, I, maybe I'll make a ro- I can make a robot that reads the punch cards, makes oh, them into Lambdas, yeah. and uploads them to the... Uh, Could you bring that to our... We do a pancake breakfast. Would you bring that to the pancake breakfast and show it off? Yeah, sure. Great. Yeah, yeah. I and just I love to get it on airport. We were also talking about your nails, which are awesome. Oh, thank you. Yeah, awesome. very nice. <laughs> so, Linda, you guys are both account CloudReach, and... Um, so what's up? What's going on at this show? What are you seeing that you really think is fascinating and mind-bending? Uh, yeah, I mean, so now this is my third serverless talk. So um, now I'm looking at, okay, like how has it changed? How the talks changed? Mm-hmm. And so I'm thinking back to the first one I went to in Austin and everyone was still kind of figuring it out. And they were kind of like, oh, I think this is the best practice. These are the tools I'm using, some frameworks. Um, and there were a few like good case studies from the Capital One and Cognitive, of course. But then the second one in New York was much like everyone um, had already figured it out and they were like, okay, here are our case studies. Um, and now now here at this one, I'm seeing much more like we built it, um, we're tweaking things, we want to know about performance, how do things actually work, and how do we monitor it and see you know, dashboards and more information. So, the data, like, yeah. So, so what, so tell, so maybe I'll actually have a mic, so I can't forget this, and I got this lavalier mic, so I don't have to grab the mic back and forth, so that's very helpful, but, so tell me about what you're working on then, like, how are you seeing new spaces opening up in your own work through, you know, the adoption of serverless technology just by consuming them yourselves, and finding, what are you discovering, what do you, what, do you, what is it that to you is revealing about, about these new capabilities? Because the resources have been accessible for a long time. 
I mean, we've been able to like access compute and networking and storage for, I mean, for decades, right? You know, and it speaks back to those roots, right? You know, the punch cards. So, what is it now? What is it now that it's just like? What are those spaces that you're finding in your work? Well, I mean, honestly, for me, day to day, like team building and finding like amazing engineers like Emily that can work on these systems is, is, is more of my priority. And then going out and seeing what the customer needs are. Yeah. But really, Emily's been more in the trenches. You want to like. So, so tell me then about a bit just so so you're building out that you're in charge of building out the technical architecture. So who are you looking for? What kind of people are you looking for? Who, who, well, who, who really fits the bill of someone who really work in your environment? It's interesting because Sam just said during his talk, Sam said, don't recruit for serverless engineers. Right. Um, just recruit for great engineers. Right. And, and really, I mean, because, you know, we're writing less code, essentially. Yeah. I mean, so, but if you're an engineer, a uh, software engineer, and you've been engineering systems by writing tons and tons of code figures on keyboards, now your job is to um, understand this like tool set, this gigantic tool set of cloud services, and then understand how you architect those pieces together. So instead of um, you know creating all the Legos, you're basically building something with these existing services. So it goes back to we're not coders, we're engineers, right. and so we're learning how to engineer differently. So Emily, what's your background in engineering? So actually, before starting the coverage, I had never done functions. Um, I had been doing servers and compute engine and stuff like that and um, yeah it's my so for the past five six months I guess I've really been delving into and uh, especially you know, just functions as a service in general and it's been really fascinating just um, I thought I would miss it doing the DevOps stuff but really it's it's amazing just to be able to you find your business need and then you just write a little service to do that and then you write another little function to do some other task and you write this. So tell me about that like history that you have, you know, in using technologies as part of a DevOps culture. What is your background in that? What was that? You were saying like how you missed the DevOps practices. Oh yeah. What is it even doing before where you were using DevOps practices? Oh I was we were just working it was a smaller company and um, there wasn't a huge dev team, so uh, everybody did everything. And I, in particular, ended up doing a lot of the um, server maintenance and things like that. So I, I loved it, but it's uh, it's nice not to worry about it. It's nice just to have the infrastructure all taken care of, and it just magically works. Um, also, I'm seeing a lot from like utilization. The, there was a talk yesterday, um, the first talk about watching uh, utilization and people think oh my servers are hot all the time and I know I've been there like I over provision hardware and then all of a sudden you know the servers are normally sitting at 15 20 percent but you don't want to go past that because you want to be able to handle spikes and things like that and just uh, with lambda like, here's a bunch of functions just <laughs> run them as needed yeah run them yeah. as needed yeah, so it's really amazing. Pre previously, at my last position, we did a lot of App Engine, which was kind of similar, kind of different. It wasn't functions as a service, but it was a platform, I guess. And you, it was, it was nice. You just never, it's magically there. And functions are just even more powerful in that regard. So how are you thinking about functions and how you are architecting now compared to when you were using more I would say probably stack-oriented environments where you might have a LAMP stack. Yeah, so so with functions, you can think a lot more modularly. Just, you can sort of lay out, here's my individual tasks, and um, what rather than trying to figure out how they fit into one server, where the different packages are going to go, and all the connections, and standing up servers, you can, you can just worry about I have this module, I have this black box, and here's the inputs, here's the outputs, and I don't care about anything else. And then there's another black box here that there's inputs and outputs too. So it's it's really interesting from, from the perspective of just, I guess, yeah, just building modular programs. You yeah. Can, and you can, you just have these all these little lab boxes that you know the inputs and outputs to, and 
they all live in various places. In so, different functions. so Emily, tell us about cloud cloud reach and what is it that it's what is it what is it it's what is cloud reach? What is it? Uh, uh, focus. Maybe you can tell us about that. Yeah, I can. Um, so I think uh, Cottage is still very much an infrastructure focused company, um, and really enablement is, is is mainly what we're concerned with. And so uh, you know, getting people to the cloud. And so that maybe that is more of like a traditional migration, and maybe that's more like containerization. But from our team, I mean, we can take people directly from on-premises to a serverless application for cloud. You know, or we can take someone who maybe did a migration at some point and we're talking about how they factor, how they modernize. Um, but really, it's about helping our customers understand, like, how do we get started with these new technologies like serverless, and how do we do it in a way that's much more like risk-free, I guess, or less risk. So you provide them with an opinionated environment? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we offer strategy, really, and, and how they would modernize their applications. Um, and then we also will do it. I mean, right now, I'm always working on a big project um, with serverless um, data pipelining and applications. Um, so we do a little bit of everything, from starting from strategy to really showing people best practices to, to building it ourselves, mm -hmm. at least on my team. Um, my team's very application. Uh, development and data engineering focus. So why are you guys looking at this space and putting an emphasis and energy in it into the serverless space? Like what is it about this space that is it really do you feel it's the next thing? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean I think that um, servers are definitely going away. I think that like our the, I think I, that's I, debatable but <laughs> Well no I mean yeah we have an AS four hundred in our office in Norfolk. So yeah. like yeah we we definitely like the the, the past we have like nostalgia <laughs> for sure. Um, and we were just talking about earlier too. I mean, moving applications off of mainframes is also still a problem that we're, yeah. needs to be solved. And how do how do serverless and mainframes intersect? Can, uh, you put a, can you put a, some functions on top of them? You know, some uh, some function mains mainframe. I mean, there's the fun. COBOL for uh, Open Whisk. Yeah, <laughs> I just right. worked it last night. So. That's how right. is it? That's right. One of our, How's COBOL uh, for Open Whisk? I, I've just been, I've just started messing with it, but OpenWhisk, um, another coworker made a COBOL runtime for uh -huh. it, so so you can run COBOL serverless in the cloud. So Woo! you know we just lift and shift these ops, and, uh, yeah, nice, make <laughs> them a little more functional and good to go. Yeah, I mean there's some licensing and proprietary software issues with mainframes, but that's something that we're we're helping tackle because it's it's a huge problem. So understanding the past understanding the future and like you said how they intersect is something that we're, we're definitely looking at I mean, yeah. we want to solve problems for everyone and if you have a server we want to help you get off of it <laughs> if you have a server we're here to help that's right Will they all be delivered to your house then is that basically the idea <laughs> yeah yeah definitely <laughs> here it comes another load that's right. business must be good we'll get you off of your server and then we'll pay for ship shipping to emily's house emily we have a question about all this machinery you have around your house. Well, this is good. I can't tell you much about it. <laughs> so, um, what do you like about the, um, the community here? At this, uh, is there a difference in the community here versus other communities you see? Is there is there kind of a there's a definite level of a, I feel like I've you know been covering events for a long time and you can feel when there's like a movement in the conference, right? You can tell. Do you think there's a body? I mean, I think that uh, one thing I've noticed really is that this community is, is just sort of like naturally become di like a diverse community. Yeah. I mean, I think just in lots of different ways. People, diversity of people, but also, I mean, Emily is a Python developer. I'm right. a Node.js developer. Right. Um, you know, there's a, there was a lot of talk about Go yesterday. So right. people from all these different language communities, um, different backgrounds, they're all finding ways that they can really... Um, use serverless architecture to solve problems and uh, build their businesses. So. You guys have container architecture uh, specialty as well? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have an a infrastructure team that's um, focused on containerization. Uh -huh. okay. You see an intersection there much in your work? I mean, there has to be, you have to have stayed sometimes, you know. Yeah, sometimes. no, ab absolutely. I mean, I think when I spoke last year, I had people tweeting me saying, why do you hate containers? And I'm like, no, I, I love containers. What? I personally do not want to make, ever manage a container, um, and that's why I love people who are great at managing containers. Do you manage containers? 
Uh, not very often, but there's certainly times where it's needed. Like I do um, a fair amount of video work where you know you have to transcribe videos and things like that, and it doesn't fit on in, in a serverless like in the what kind of video work system. Um, just stitching together videos, transcribing videos, stuff like that. Um, in the past, I worked a ton with videos, just combining videos, generating videos, converting videos, everything with videos, and then also with these data engineering tests. And sometimes you just need some custom software to run. You need to set up a custom stack so you can create a Docker image and then you know, yeah. throw it up, do what you need, tear yeah. it down, and get it to go. And those are big files. Those are big video files that you're working with. Too. So you must yeah, have... You, you it know. depends, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So what are the frameworks that you're using, for example, with the video? For video stuff? Yeah. Most of the video stuff that I worked with in the past was all custom. So we would do just a lot of, like, FFmpeg or stuff like that. Transcribing and converting. So, so in terms of the, you know, your own backgrounds, maybe, you know, people here are, like, kind of looking to get into this space. Like, what are your own backgrounds? that speak to like you know where you are now what maybe just give a little kind of background you're you know you as an engineer what did you get prior to sure sure so i spent a lot of years in government service government contracting um i did uh net for a while in java huge enterprise applications and then um then i switched to node.js and um just completely left the government worked for an open source company and then a startup um, which was ultimately acquired which by CloudReach. Uh, Emerging Technology Advisors. Okay. Yeah, so it was um, folded into CloudReach about a year ago yeah. now. Um, and so, you know, really I think I spent years as an engineer, um, and then when I went to ETA, it was really more about strategy and thinking about best practices and helping solve problems. And so I've carried that over more to CloudReach, and one of the things you know, and I think too, when you're you're in a startup where you're offering advice to customers, you have to be thinking about the future all the time. Like, what, what, what's the next steps? What are the best products? If I'm going to recommend a product to a client. Like, I have to know that when they get a heavy workload, that this architecture is going to stand up. Um, and so I have to really, I have to really be able to go out, like, talk to, you know, the the best people in the community and get their opinions. And um, and you know, really, that's kind of like where we are now with uh, with Cambridge. We just have taken like my like years of experience and the different like diverse experiences of all the people in my team. And we're saying, okay, this is what we believe the way forward is. These are the best practices, and now we're gonna help our customers solve their problems. Great. And Emily, how about your background? Where, you know, how did you get started in software development? Uh, well, I took a computer programming class in high school, and then I really liked it, so what I kept doing it. What did you learn? Uh, C++. Nice. Yeah, I, so I was basic back in the day. Okay, yeah, I did QBasic, like in 8th and ninth grade, then I took computer programming, and then went to school to computer science, and then I fell into digital advertising, so for the past... Or before CloudReach, for 10 years I did digital advertising, just different uh, campaigns for different clients. And, um, yeah, it was really fascinating and it gave a lot of room to explore because it was these smaller campaigns. I mean, not smaller, but they would last six months or something like that. So you would work on a technology, you would draw everything up and then it would be on to the next project where you'd have to develop a whole new stack and, and create whole new whole new things that hadn't been done before. So it was pretty interesting. But it also sort of, I guess, um, got me used to the fast-paced world of, like serverless, where stuff is iterating so fast and it's such a developing uh, ecosystem where it's so new and the tools are still being built just to support everything. I, there's a lot of vendors here that are just providing things that are desperately needed and they're in startup phase. They're, oh yeah, we've been out six months or a year and it's just crazy. So yeah. There's so much to keep up with and it's changing Yeah, and they so need fast. tools and they're trying to build tools. Yeah. yeah. You have to talk about your robots. What about my robots? Well, you have a server full, a house full of servers. You also yeah, have a house I mean, full of robots too. Yeah, so, yeah. so I... Um, I like robots a lot. Um, 
I mean, one day they're gonna take over the world, so it's better to be their friend. Why do you even say that? Why do you even say that? It's better to be their friend now Why do you because even... they're going to look at the podcast like later. <laughs> they're gonna see it on the internet when they're scanning the entire internet to find friends, and they're gonna say, "Oh, Emily said the robots are the future." See, see what my view is like. I want to make robot friends. I want to like be friends. Like, like if I develop robot, if we develop robots, I'm gonna. I want to treat them really nice. Robots are my friends. I love robots. Yeah. I love robots. They're my What's the difference between... Okay, so here's a question for you. <laughs> yeah. How do you define a robot versus a bot? Um, for me, a, a robot is normally um, something mechanical. So, I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a mobile. For me, I, it's not always the case, but a lot of times robots are more... Um, Automated physical computing, yeah, kind of physical thing. computing, and a bot is a lot of times something digital where it's yeah. just software, yeah, and you know, a Slack bot where yeah. it just responds on Slack or right. a chat bot, whatever, right? So, I mean, there's definitely an intersection there, and yeah, I guess Rhonda is a bot and a robot because it's sort of Rhonda. Oh, Rhonda is my te the telepresence robot I'm working on. Oh, Rhonda. Yeah. So, yeah, so my, my coworker Stanley was was lonely. He moved to New York. Okay. And he wanted a telepresence robot, so I started working on one. Yeah. Because I have a room full of robot parts. So um, you know, Raspberry Pi and some compute and a little cardboard box on a robot base and then it can move around but it also can communicate um, over some WebRTC and Lambdas and stuff like that. And then you can have um, a telepresence. Nice. Yeah. So that's what I've been working on um, in my spare time when Linda is in whipping. Who's <laughs> And just back, you're like, yeah. <laughs> work faster, work harder. You've Rhonda. only worked 120 hours this week. What's he doing back there? Server. Just What's kidding. Really doing, Rhonda? Cloud Reach is great place. <laughs> happy, happy, happy place. Yeah. <laughs> Listen to more episodes of the New Stack Makers at thenewstack.io slash podcasts. Please rate and review us on iTunes, like us on YouTube, and follow us on SoundCloud. Thanks for listening, and see you next time.